Don't ever tell me what to do. I'm so sick of people trying to control me. You are going to get in hella more trouble for this than drugs. Nobody would ever even miss your punk ass, would they? Get that gun away from me, psycho! Yes! BAFTA for story goes to... Life is Strange. During the resurgence of the point-and-click adventure game genre, Life is Strange by Don't Nod seems to be one that managed to make a name for itself even after five years of its release. Their success went as far as producing a prequel, sequel, and even rumors of a third game. Especially noteworthy since it was the second game ever by the company, which then essentially launched them into relevancy. And the game's community is proof of that. And it's most notable for touching subject matters in a high school setting that spoke to a lot of people. Unfortunately, a game that should appeal to me in a lot of ways, and even more so today, is greatly held back by the story to reliance on a friendship between an idiot and the worst best friend character that I can't bring myself to loving. Anyway, here's the intro. I'm a huge fan of the two protagonist dynamic, specifically best friend characters. In fact, some of my favorite stories revolve around this sort of relationship. And while more often than not these characters aren't the best people together, their imperfections that complement one another should lend itself to compelling narratives or fun scenarios. And to see that in a story may shed some light on how you treat your friends, as you try to draw parallels with what you find relatable in the relationship. And in a story where it hinges on you liking your best friend, Life is Strange failed miserably in having me care for this character named Chloe. But before we continue, here's the story. Moving back to her hometown, Maxine Caulfield is a photography student excited to pursue her studies in Blackwell Academy, whilst under the supervision of the well-renowned Mark Jefferson. But during a visit in the girls' bathrooms, Max stumbles upon two people in a feud. As she hides in the corner, she witnesses a gunshot and instinctively reaches her hand out and cries in distress. Suddenly, Time rewinds, and Max is back where she was just several minutes ago before the confrontation. Turns out she has time powers. She later finds out that the person who got shot was her childhood best friend, Chloe Price. They haven't interacted with each other since they were 13. Now reunited, the two characters catch up on each other's lives, sort some personal stuff out, and uncover the dark truths that lay hidden in Arcadia Bay. All the wild visions of a tornado haunt Maxine. So, who are these characters anyway? As we established, Max is a photographer, but also a self-proclaimed nerd. Interested in her craft and all sorts of media, she's quiet, reserved, and the embodiment of a shy dork. Chloe, by contrast, is a punk. Rebellious, hot-headed, and generally a snarky person who gets into trouble due to her loud mouth. In the absence of Max's presence, Chloe's latest best friend, Rachel, is currently missing and subsequently becomes the MacGuffin that becomes this narrative's catalyst. So it's the archetypical contrast between two very opposing personalities that somehow gel together. And it usually goes like this. Establish characters, put them in unlikely circumstances, both learn something from each other and grow as characters, and then they come out of their relationship as changed people, for better or for worse. You can't keep getting away with it! This is of course simplifying things, but this is generally how these sorts of stories end up. And in the special case of Chloe, she doesn't really change. If anything, as the story goes along, Chloe becomes a worse person, and this isn't a Mark and Jeremy dynamic where it's done with intent. This is a narrative that forces Max to care about Chloe because of the power of friendship. Which wouldn't really warrant a video from me if that were just it, but due to how awful Chloe is, it elevates the narrative from bad to an award-winning mess. And since the game is episodic in nature, allow me to be your tour guide as we descend into madness as each episode progresses. By the way, here's a bingo card. Keep an eye on it, okay? Cool. So let's go. 
Before we hone in on Chloe, let's establish the foundation of what this relationship rests upon. The narrative's focus is more directed at the character's emotions, instead of the specifics of how Max's powers work. So, if you're here to find out exactly why Max has her powers beyond thematic narrative reasons, you're not gonna get that here. And since the summary is basically the first episode, let's discuss what you'll witness first. The visuals. They're impressionistic and mostly warm. Its environmental design is filled with references of other media, and the UI has a bit of character. Specifically Max's diary. And won't you look at that, she has even watched Scott Pilgrim a million times. Cool. There is a lot of attention to detail, so it's a neat touch. And the first episode itself is fairly standard. Nothing to write home about, but it establishes its tone pretty well. A young adult drama with a supernatural twist, now accompanied with some indie music, a genre I associate with high school, and then yeah, I'm starting to feel the nostalgia from this game. But the game's visuals start stumbling when it gets into the facial animations. They're stiff and unemotive. A studio of this size can only do so much, I guess. And by looking at A Plague Tale, a game created by a studio with a similar number of employees, it's not much better. Phase tracking is pretty expensive, you know? But that doesn't mean we're unable to criticize it. Considering Telltale's Walking Dead during its release had an employee number similar to these studios, and is a lot more expressive despite being years older. The lack of strong facial expressions put these characters in an emotive, uncanny valley that is even more detrimental in a narrative-focused game. At least Hannah Tell and Ashley Birch do a good job selling a soft-spoken introvert and a hothead, respectively. So where does it start genuinely falling apart? The dialogue. I hope you check the perimeter, as my step ass would say. Now, let's talk business. Speaking of hip and fast, we should cruise out in my car to an actual movie this week. He's no match for you and me now. That was an epic win. I'm just a girl alone in my room. By the way, Don't Nod is a French company. So things probably got lost in translation. And despite an American with a BA in English being a lead writer, Christian Devine's book smarts fails to capture how young people speak. I think they were trying to go for a charming and quirky vibe, but it ends up sounding kind of forced. Mordecai and Rigby calling each other planks and holes sounded a lot more natural than this. But to get into the meat of the first episode, we find out not only is Chloe's best friend missing, but her dad, who she adored, died thanks to a car accident. This happened soon after Max's departure, which is the reason for Chloe's angst-ridden rebellious phase. Despite all this, Chloe's mother is trying to do her best to support her daughter alongside her new boyfriend, David. He's an ex-vet who's now a security guard in Blackwell Academy, a bit more rough and stern than Chloe's biological father. He's often suspicious of Chloe, and when he can't find one of his guns, he goes as far to accuse her of stealing it, which leads into an argument. And depending on your choices, Chloe's stepdad will hit her, which alludes to domestic abuse, which makes Chloe's hatred of him justified. So if it never occurs though, you're kind of left wondering why Chloe hates her stepdad so much, besides the usual bratty rebel hates their conservative stepparent. But you could argue that we can blame the player for not exploring the different options through Max's rewind powers, so take that as you will. Despite only spending a day together after five years apart, Max is happy to state that Chloe is once again her best friend after Chloe gifts Max her late dad's Polaroid. So far, it's an okay, albeit flawed game. Maybe we'll just get used to these issues and we'll just fall in love with these characters once their actions dictate to their arc. So from this point on, we're going to be focusing specifically on Max's and Chloe's relationship. Everything else I'll touch upon lightly, but we've got to stay on course. Alright, let's keep on moving. Chloe starts becoming more involved with Max, and my contempt for Chloe starts growing here. What Chloe and Max did in the first episode was essentially catch up on each other's lives. So development hasn't really begun. With this in mind, a story like this would lead into a relationship where these characters start to reconnect on a deeper level. And despite one of the characters being vastly different years later, they can still touch base on something they shared back then. Or have a common thread that progresses to the next logical step of the narrative. And the game's first step into doing this is for Max to convince Chloe she has time travel powers in the most roundabout way. Uh, but whatever, we need to have a game with puzzle elements. What comes after, however, is my first big gripe with Chloe. 
Once you're done proving your powers to her, she wants to do more shenanigans with you at a junkyard. Fair enough. On your way out of the diner, you're given the choice to answer a phone call from somebody who's been a victim of severe online bullying. And the mere act of answering this quick phone call has Chloe pissed off at you. Okay? I'm sorry that I can't give you my undivided attention for a few minutes, Chloe, but whatever. The scene later ensues to collecting bottles and shooting them in different sorts of ways in the junkyard. Jesus, I sh shot myself! Ugh, I shot myself! Back up, back Stupid up! gun! Hold on, Chloe. As the duo experiments with Max's powers, things progress to a point where she blacks out and has a nosebleed. So this is a pretty big deal, right? And anyone would steer clear into caution if their best friend blacked out doing something intense. Despite Max saying that she shouldn't be used like a toy, Chloe just guilt trips Max to do more dumb things. And this happens twice. Hey, Chloe, didn't you just see what just happened? Also, Chloe did steal David's gun, so not only is Chloe careless, but also David's suspicions of her were right. Never mind the fact that she lacks the intellect to take off her own boot when it's stuck in a train track. They're not even laced. Also, Max, why don't you just reverse time before she got stuck in the train track? This comes after the scene where Chloe's drug dealer confronts her for owing him $5,000. So, she's also undependable. And prior to this episode, Chloe just comes off as needy. How can you expect a friend to keep in contact with you when you were separated at the age of 13 of 2008 when you yourself didn't make an effort to contact Max? There's no mention of Chloe trying to contact Max in her diary, and with how guilt-ridden she's been from Chloe berating her, you'd think she'd bring it up at some point. The prequel retcons this, but that game has its own host of problems. So by the ending of this episode, what have we learned? Chloe is inconsiderate, impulsive, and generally reckless. According to Max's diary, she's just kind of bothered by the fact that Chloe just wanted to see those rewind powers. But later on, she states she felt awesome when Chloe said this was the best week of her life. So, you know, that's something, I guess. By the way, Max, if your friend wants to hang out with you just because you have that one thing, you're not friends. You're a tool for their enjoyment. But maybe, Chloe learns the error of her ways later on, so let's keep an eye out for that. Too bad the series couldn't be focused on Kate Marsh, but I digress. Let's keep on moving. So, there's a scene in this episode where Chloe berates David. David has a lot of surveillance cameras everywhere, and I agree with Chloe here. David's paranoia is a bit much. But ultimately, Chloe and David have the same goal, which is investigate the disappearance of Rachel. So, things get out of hand, and Max is able to divert the conversation by attempting to unite the two against a common enemy. And Chloe gets mad at Max for being open-minded and trying to understand somebody else's position. You know you can disagree with somebody's methods, while still understanding their reasons for doing so, right? How is David's investigations any different to what we are doing anyway? We literally broke into a school and read papers not meant for our eyes. Why are you being so hypocritical? It's okay if we do it is not exactly the best message. Something like this also happened in the first episode. From gun control to reckless toying around. Cause men. Which is understandable, but it seems like Chloe is greater threat to herself than anyone else. At least David is making the attempt to investigate Rachel's disappearance. You know, your missing best friend? Last seen with your drug dealer, which you owe $5,000. Which you were willing to steal from a handicap fund just to pay off your debt. And if heaven forbid Max takes the moral high ground, she doesn't shrug it off as a joke, but is visibly bummed out because Max has morals higher than Chloe's mound of dirt. What an amazing person for a protagonist to fall in love with. Accusing Max and her mom gossiping about her during a casual conversation. So not only is she needlessly judgmental, but she also thinks that she's the center of the universe. Also, why does Chloe say Max bailed on her as if Max made the deliberate decision to move away? She's willing to show her blatant ungratefulness by putting Max down despite saving her life. Twice. Chloe, your current friendship is centered around these two events. At least show a bit of compassion. Oh, by the way, before I get too far ahead of myself, 
The reason why they broke into the school is because they're essentially trying to find where Rachel went and how the school and Nathan, the boy who shot Chloe in the beginning, ties into all this. They hang in the pool and have a sleepover later on. I felt nothing from either scene. And later on in the episode, they break into Chloe's drug dealer's RV. His name is Frank, by the way. They do this to get info on Rachel's disappearance, and they find out that Rachel and Frank had something going on. Chloe gets rightfully pissed off, but she takes her anger out on Max. So then Max says to Chloe that she should stop blaming everyone for her problems. And then Chloe says, and I quote, Gotta blame somebody, otherwise it's all my fault. I think her rant is supposed to be relatable and we're supposed to feel sorry for her because she's an ultra victim of some sort. But all this scene does is further cement Chloe into being a more awful friend. Then the game out of nowhere gives Max new powers. By looking through a photo she's taken, it allows her to time travel to that specific spot of that photo. This ability could have been established a bit earlier, you know? But whatever. Realizing that she can alter the present by traveling into vignettes of the past, Max stops Chloe's dad from driving on the day of his lethal car crash, thus making the angst-ridden Chloe non-existent. But thanks to the butterfly effect, Chloe instead gets into a car crash, making her a quadriplegic. No, I am not joking. They had to cripple Chloe in order for you to feel bad for her. Honestly, this twist would be great if my feelings weren't contrived thanks to Chloe's lack of development. Cause I'm feeling nothing from these scenes except for fabricated sentimentality. The game is more obsessed with forcing a feeling upon you in the moment without thinking about the actions these characters have done in the past. And when you look at the past three episodes, Chloe is a reckless, self-important person willing to commit Grand Theft as a band-aid fix for her poor decisions that she's unwilling to improve upon. Aren't we supposed to like Chloe? Max, how can you be best friends with such a bi bingo? Bingo! Bingo! Oh, uh, by the way, uh, nothing really happens in episode. So now we're with Chloe in a different timeline. While ultimately pointless since Max reverses her decision, I think what the game is trying to do is show what lengths Max would do for Chloe. Which sucks since I feel like you can make a whole story dedicated to this exact scenario. Two best friends reconnecting after years apart only to find out that one of them had a severely life-altering accident. And I honestly would have loved to explore these situations, in which we attempt to juggle an average high school life, while the guilt of abandoning our childhood best friend weighs on our mind. And the first few moments of Chloe and Max reconnecting seems like a start for the first episode of a five episode long series. But it's cut short with Chloe wanting to be euthanized. This is to ease the burden on her and her parents' finances. At least it's better than being stuck on train tracks. It's a difficult scene for sure, and I sympathize with this Chloe. And I want to be clear here. I sympathize with this Chloe. Not blue-haired Chloe. They are drastically different people once the timeline splits. So whatever sliver of feeling I have for Crip Chloe isn't going to be transferred to current Chloe. The one where Max admits that she's tired about having to walk eggshells around. Anyway, so the story continues as the duo still keep on looking for Rachel, and Max and Chloe attempt to get info by talking to Frank. She ends up killing him and his dog, so Max has to yet again set things right by using her rewind powers. Fantastic! The game forces Chloe to kill these two, by the way, so that their spared lives are the solution to this puzzle. You can't get it right on the first go, Holy shit! The duo get whatever info they need and connect the dots that lead them to an abandoned farm. It's got an underground bunker filled with expensive photography equipment. On a shelf, there were binders labeled with familiar names. It had photos of girls in disturbing positions, one of whom was Rachel. Her photos showcased pictures of her posed in all manner of ways in the junkyard with Nathan. They return to that location and after a bit of digging, Chloe and Max uncover Rachel's dead body and episode 4 ends. Yo, psych! Not really. Chloe, wanting revenge, 
drives to a party where Nathan is supposed to be attending. They couldn't find him at the party, but they get an ominous text from him, essentially saying that nobody will find Rachel's dead body again, which brings the characters back to Rachel's spot. Once they return, they get ambushed. Max gets drugged, and Chloe gets shot in the head. No matter what happens, Chloe just kicks the bucket. And here comes the reveal. The real culprit was the teacher all along. What? His motivations are so stupid, I can't really believe this is the guy. <laughs> So, the first half of this episode is spent on Max trying to course correct while witnessing the destruction that's been happening in Arcadia Bay. Things are getting pretty bad, and Max is clearly distraught by all this. So, Max time travels to the spot right before entering the party. What led to Chloe's death was her rash thinking and letting her emotions get the better of her. So what Max tries to do is convince Chloe to not do whatever she's gonna do. So she's essentially being like, Chloe, stop being Chloe for a bit. But, despite knowing that Max is a time traveler and knowing the ramifications of their actions, Chloe goes ahead and does her own thing anyway. So this is the best thing the game has right after a character's lowest point of the story. Chloe being an idiot. And Max, once again, has to convince this moron, despite the numerous instances where Max has saved her in under a week, to not be an idiot. This whole conversation can be summed up as Max reminding Chloe that she has time powers and that you should trust someone with the time powers. Is this what having a best friend is like? Is your relationship with your best friend like this? Because if it is, I suggest reevaluating a few things. So through the power of common sense, Max convinces Chloe. And because of how bad the tornado is getting, they decide to go to the lighthouse because they deem it's the safest place to be during this whole thing is going down. Yeah, I don't know. Why not the <laughs> why not the bunker in, in 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 the farm? You know, I'm sure she, I'm pretty sure you can lock it somewhere. I don't know. But Max blacks out and goes through an interesting trippy sequence, abstract imagery of her potential regrets and fears and all that sort of stuff. I like it a lot. It's then bookended by a scene where the game finally calls out on Max's hypocrisy and Chloe's awful influence through a shadow Max of some sort. It's kind of like that scene from the disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya but it fails to be as impactful. This scene portrays the protagonist confronting the personification of the lie that he tells himself. That despite all the wacky antics that he's been through, when given the choice to stay or revert back to his original reality, he reverts. While his other self insists on Kion wanting a normal life in this new timeline, a belief he's held for the longest time, he finally admits to himself that he enjoyed the time he had in the original even with the danger and stress that it caused him. The normal high school life, even with its benefits, just doesn't compare to what he originally had. This personification is made for the protagonist to disagree with, which is done to fulfill this character's arc. And while you may ultimately agree with the final decision, you can't help but feel torn knowing he's leaving a reality where he had to break someone's heart. The quiet shy girl who finally gains the courage to ask him to join the club, only to be rejected because Kian has to be honest with himself. You can't just let somebody's hopes up and then just leave them forever. This is how you do a scene like this. This is how you do good high school drama with a supernatural twist. Yo, why did the disappearance of Nagato Yuki-chan have to suck? So, how does Life is Strange tackle a scene similar to this? Well, the other Max is quite odd. She is the personification of ideas that we're supposed to be disagreeing with, right? But, for the most part, almost everything she's saying are things I agree with. You know, like calling Max a hypocrite, how she's wasting her time powers, and how Chloe is a bad friend. But imaginary Chloe barges in to save real Max from other Max. And she says something to the effect of, Both of us have been through a lot this past week. You cannot break us apart. So the game takes even less time than Y2K with the protagonist battling their inner demons. Cool.
Soon after, we are literally transported to a trip down memory lane, as the game reminds us about all the good times Max has had with Chloe. But it's hard to reminisce about those times when your memories of them lack any emotional weight, and happen prior or right after Chloe doing something stupid. Getting a camera from Chloe or shooting bottles might have been a good time, but the fact that she uses a gun she stole recklessly, all the while disregarding Max's well-being, is in the forefront of my mind. And I'm not even saying Chloe has to be the most likable person ever. Awful people can be interesting. It's just when the story tries to convince us that this friendship is great, despite how awful Chloe treats Max if you don't agree with her even with the most asinine things, it becomes frustrating. Max, isolated from Chloe, is fine. But her willingness to keep up with Chloe's shenanigans brings her down dramatically. She literally writes down in her diary that despite being opposites, we're so alike. In what way, Max? That you're both idiots? I'm having a complete disconnect with Max because of her continued insistence to keep the shallow friendship afloat. Oh, what a great time I had swimming in the pool, shooting bottles, and taking that selfie together. Time for our steampunk Chloe to thrash to some indie music. Ooh, what a memory! Can't wait to replay that in my head over and over again. Okay, so, but once that sequence ends, we are transported back to the present, and the two conclude that the reason why any of this is happening is because of Chloe's continued existence. Destiny wants Chloe to die, but Max keeps preventing it from happening. And then you're given one of two choices. Either let Chloe die by getting shot at the beginning of episode one, or sacrifice Arcadia Bay for your best friend. Even though we have no idea if the trail of destruction will continue to persist with Chloe's existence. But, whatever. And given what I've said, you probably know which one I've picked. But seriously, this game sucks because of Chloe. So, Chloe, what have we learned? Let's do a quick rundown of who you are. You're immature, you resent everybody ever since your dad died, but you put in no effort to do anything to help yourself, you disrespect your mother, you owe your drug dealer a lot of money, you stole a gun and use it immaturely, you're pissed off if we don't steal from the handicap, and the only fun you guys have is when you tell Max to do things. Shoot bottles, hang in the pool, guess the amount of change in your pocket. How riveting. Good thing Max lacks a hint of initiative in this relationship, because you might get pissed off if she decided to do anything unrelated to you. I can't think of a genuine moment between these two that made me enjoy watching their friendship. All that springs to mind is how much they talk about the past, and how much they are best friends, and how much Chloe misses Rachel. What has changed between episode 1 and 5? Chloe is the exact same person throughout this entire series. I mean, she does spill her guts in the final scene of the game, but it just kinda comes out of nowhere because the scene calls for it. Not necessarily because we see Chloe develop over time to a more empathetic person. Waka, the Grand Wizard, has his faith and ignorance tested through a number of scenes. As he unknowingly befriends someone he's racist against while his religion turns out to be a sham. It takes time and meaningful events to shake off these bad habits. And Chloe lacks these scenes of development and I am struggling to remember redeemable qualities that she has learned throughout her journey. I rewatch those scenes featured in Memory Lane because I assume they're considered the highlights of their relationship. And guess what? None of it was compelling at all. And it's not like I can't enjoy the themes or ideas the game is trying to explore. It's just that the core relationship of this game is nowhere near as compelling as everyone makes it seem to be. This sets the bar so low for stories and games if this is what we're praising, and these lists of problems reinforce this point. And I'm not saying there's nothing to like here. Characters like Kate and David have decent likable arcs and are infinitely more interesting when compared to Chloe. But I guess we're all too focused on a relationship that may fall apart at any moment if Max didn't have her time powers. So you might be wondering, Yurik, why'd you even play this game? Well, mainly it's because I've been revisiting some games to see if my experiences with them have remained the same. And with the case of Life is Strange, I just ended up disliking it more than I initially did. But I will say this though. 
What I commend on Don't Nod more than anything is their willingness to tackle these sorts of topics in a video game format with characters that Square Enix was willing to take a risk on. While not the most compelling story, I appreciate the efforts and attempt. And the great thing is that there's only going up from here, since Life is Strange is far from perfect. Because here's the thing. I can excuse stilted animation and awkward dialogue. I can excuse powers with plot convenience, but I can't excuse an awful relationship between two characters that are meant to be best friends and lovers. If the romance is the largest highlight in this game, I am so sorry that the bar of romance in games is this low. Life is Strange is okay at best and painful at worst, and it's at its worst a lot. And for the sake of comparison, Let's take a quick look at another game with similar ideas and see if it's any better. Night in the Woods is a game I've yet to complete, and it has a similar instance of a protagonist coming back to her hometown and meeting up with someone they were best friends with back in the day. And the contrast between the two is clear. B hates the fact that May is back, stating that May is wasting her opportunity in getting a higher education. Despite May's irresponsibility, she brings back some excitement into Bay's mature but mundane life by causing a bit of harmless fun. In the amount of time it took to finish the first episode of Life is Strange, I found these young adults more relatable than these idiots. And yes, even with the slightly forced hashtag deep and screw the world attitude. And don't get me wrong, the writing is far from amazing, but at least there's a likable, relatable chemistry between May and B. At least when compared to these other idiots. Their moments of friendship and romance lack impact since the only thing that stands out in this relationship to me is Chloe getting pissed off at Max for not giving her undivided attention. But whatever, they kiss and are willing to destroy an entire town that has treated Max much kinder than Chloe ever has. So yeah, I don't think it's a good game at all. In fact, I think it's really bad. And listen, if you enjoyed this game and it means a lot to you, cool. Me critiquing this game isn't a critique on you as a person. I like a lot of things that are associated with generally stupid stuff, but I am someone who is made up of more than the media I consume. I'm not here to diminish people's positive feelings on this game. I just wanted to express my thoughts. And I know as people we may have different definitions for certain words. Different perspectives, experiences, and upbringings drive us to particular conclusions. And what I got out of this story was that Don't Nod was trying to establish this friendship where we do fall for Chloe, and wish that Max still kept in contact with her when she moved away. And this is done by having Chloe's attitude fade away when Max re-enters her life, thus fulfilling the whole what-if fantasy where we could travel back in time to change things, where our unkindled friendships in the present didn't have to burn out. But she doesn't return to her old self. She gets worse, and every moment of her makes me wish I never reached out. Because I can't, for the life of me, find an angle where Chloe is a good friend, let alone a best friend. And given what I've said, I hope you can understand now why I consider Chloe as the worst best friend. What about Vic Van Leer, though? What, from NBA 2K16? Oh. Oh. Ah, uh, sh- <laughs>